The process of adding a work of art to the collection usually begins with a curator. A curator means something like caretaker. It comes from the Latin to care for. And the dictionary definition of a curator runs along the lines of someone who manages and oversees a collection. But they're also responsible for adding to it. Where do they find these very precious works of art? Well, there are a number of areas. A good curator, someone who's really on top of the subject, uh, knows where many, many works of art are in private collections, works of art that might come onto the market, and they keep their notes thoroughly and, and wait for these things to happen. And when they do come onto the market, they usually come on in one of two ways, unless the collector's selling it him or herself. They come through a dealer, specialists with an establishment who deal with particular kinds of art. It's very, very unusual to find an artist, who, an art, a, a dealer who works uh, with modern and contemporary work to be doing anything else, or it can come through one of the great auction houses, the New York, London, Paris um, auction houses. Uh, but wherever it is, the first thing the curator has to do is to persuade me that it's worth going after. Well, the jewel casket and the Asante sword are both examples of works for purchase consideration that were recommended by one of our curators to the director. And once they received approval to bring these works in so that they could be examined, um, that's when the registrar's department comes into play. I'm actually standing uh, right now in the registrar's holding area, which is an art storage area. It's a temporary art storage area. And all objects coming in for possible acquisition um, or going out on loan or for various other reasons, anything coming in and out of the building enters through this um, enters through this room so that it can be registered in by the by the registrar. When uh, a new uh, a work for purchase consideration comes in as the casket, uh, the registrar will take a digital photograph of it, will write a condition report, um, will tag it with a number, uh, and notify the curator that it's here, examine the packing material and so on and so forth, and create a record for it. And those records are one of the most important things that we do. We have records for all of the years we've been a museum. We have records for most of our art acquisitions. Once an object has been approved and has been approved by our board of directors, uh, it's then time for us to attach a permanent number to it. And in most cases, we're going to paint that number actually on the object. And I'm, I'm sure that many visitors to the museum wonder what that little number is that they see off in a corner someplace. It's usually visible because we don't want to have to lift things up in storage to figure out what the number is. So we want it to be visible, but we don't want it to be on the side that's necessarily going to be displayed. So once we have finished with it, usually within 24 hours after it arrives uh, here in the building, um, and the curator has come down to look at it, we usually have it moved on to conservation, and they pick it up from there. After the object is processed by the registrar's department, it is brought by the museum technicians to conservation where we conduct a, a physical examination. Basically, we're looking at methods and materials and how the object is made. Our studies will assist in the art historical and historical research that is conducted by the curator, the authenticity studies, if it was made out of the correct uh, materials that were present in that particular century or period of time, and the provenance studies, which um, means where the object has been over the course of its history. We, this research will aid in its care and understanding the object. The contents of a condition report is pretty standard. There's the name and date of the examiner. There's a description of the object, its structure, materials and composition. 
the condition and nature and extent of any alterations if it's ever been changed or restored in the past, um, any kind of discovery we've made during this investigative process. We use visible, ultraviolet, infrared, a lot of different techniques including x-rays to examine the object. And then what we do is write down this particular history and we do recommendations for its future or uh, current needs for its long-term care. And if treatment is proposed, we will uh, give a, a treatment proposal with what the kind of care that object is going to need. When an object comes into the museum for a potential acquisition, I like to spend a considerable amount of time with it. The curator has seen it and been familiar with it, but for me, it's the first time that I'm um, looking at it. The, um, my report will consist of a general description of the object, what it's made of, how it's put together, uh, the current condition of the object, whether there have been previous repairs, I'm not necessarily answering questions of authenticity, but occasionally uh, those uh, questions will, will be answered. Uh, the first thing I do is a general physical examination under uh, general light. Uh, following that, I might uh, examine it under the microscope, under ultraviolet light, and depending on what I find, we might do additional tests such as x-radiography or x-ray fluorescence spectroscopy. As I was examining the sword, I noticed that the blade had a number of markings on it at one end, but that it was covered elsewhere by the sheath, which could not be removed. The sheath is made of leather, which is very brittle and easily cracked, and I was afraid of damaging it further if I tried to remove it. So that I had the idea that perhaps we could x-ray the blade and determine if indeed the decorations that I saw up here continued down toward the tip. So. The sword was taken to the x-ray room, placed on the floor, and the x-ray machine was lowered from the ceiling. Uh, film was put under the sword blade, and we did several exposures to determine whether we could penetrate the metal. And we were able to do that, and we were able to pick up uh, some very interesting markings and de designs. This is a German jewel casket dating to around 1700. During the examination, I became curious about what the various metals were that uh, composed the plaques and the foil and the filigree decoration. So it was taken to the analytical lab for X-ray fluorescence spectroscopy analysis, which is a non-destructive means of determining elemental content, such as uh, metal alloys in this case. In the analysis, we discovered that the elements that appear gold are silver, but also contain mercury and copper. The fact that it's mercury gilded indicates, um, helps indicate some age to these pieces. Once the work of art has been given a clean bill of health by the conservator and we've checked out the provenance, the history of the ownership of the work of art to make sure that there's nothing problematic uh, in that history, it goes in front of a panel made up of the curators. This is what we call the collections prep meeting. I get together with the curatorial department heads and we review the objects that individual curators wish to be considered for acquisition. The consensus at this meeting is to recommend purchasing both the jewel casket and the Asante sword, but the collections prep meeting is actually a dress rehearsal for the larger collections committee meeting of the board of trustees, which involves trustees and a few specialist individuals, and it's at this subsequent larger meeting that the work of art is officially recommended to the board of trustees to be acquired for the museum. The DIA is fortunate in having funds to buy works of art year in, year out. And this money comes from restricted funds that were given by individuals for the specific purpose of buying art. 
In fact, sometimes they're restricted to the kind of work that we, uh, of art that we can buy. Art made by American artists born before 1875, for example. And some of the funds go on to specify how the money would be taken away from us if we used it for anything else, like paying the heating bills. But actually, only about 10% of the works of art that you see in US museums comes from purchases by the museums. Where does the rest come from? Well, above the entrance to the DIA's Great Hall, there is an epigram that says, Sint Mycenatis non deerent flaxae maronis. And it's a sort of a shorthand for without patrons, there would be no artists. Whether or not you agree with that, most of the works of art that you see in the DIA comes from gifts from individuals, usually knowledgeable collectors, but sometimes just individuals have something beautiful that they want to pass on to the public. Once the museum has acquired the new work of art, our photography department captures the object on film and enters it into our computer-based library called TMS, or the museum system. Here, Dirk Backer, our director of photography, photographs the jewel casket from a variety of angles using a professional roll camera tethered to and controlled by a computer. Once the jewel casket has been thoroughly documented, the photos and brief descriptions of the work are filed away using an accession number that Pam Watson spoke about earlier. As you can imagine, having an in-house photography department is a great advantage when it comes to documenting the works in our permanent collection. So let's review the process. You've seen how the curator finds the work of art and brings it to me for consideration. You've seen how it's brought in and looked at by the conservation department, how it goes on for further discussion at the uh, curatorial review and then onto the Board of Trustees Collections Committee, and how it's finally photographed and entered into our records. There's just one thing left. How do we get these important things into the galleries for our public to see and enjoy? What you're about to see is a mock installation of the jewel casket. We fine-tune our installation process based on the type of art object we're dealing with. The jewel casket is a work of decorative art. Museum technicians Mike Kearns and Tracy Morton carefully transport the object on a cart equipped with shock-absorbing rubber wheels. Wearing latex gloves, they lift and place the object on a specially designed pedestal. Once in position, the vitrine is sealed with a plexiglass top which is carefully positioned using special suction cups. This enclosure provides adequate climate control and allows the object to be viewed clearly and from multiple angles. When it's time to actually install this piece, we'll light it properly and label it. So now you know the careful process that we go through when bringing a work of art into the DIA's collection. You can learn more about these works of art on dia.org and the rest of our programming too. I hope you enjoyed the program. We certainly enjoyed having you. Until next time, this is Graham Beale, your guide to one of America's great museums, the Detroit Institute of Arts.